Take your Bibles, turn to Zephaniah, chapter number 3. Zephaniah, chapter number 3. Probably not your most popular book that you run to to read after every day. But Zephaniah, chapter number 3. I'd like to go on record as saying this certainly will not become the most popular message that I've ever preached but I'm not so certain that it won't be the most needed message that I've ever preached or certainly preached in a long, long time. The Lord's been dealing with me for some time. Uh, I just uh, am burdened about revival and burdened why revival don't come. And uh, the simple reason is, is there are things hindering God's people. And today, with God's help, we're going to try and reveal some of the hindrance. Uh, many times we ourselves don't know what holds us back or what hinders us. If you weren't here Wednesday, I would highly encourage you to get Brother Sidney Weaver's message. He was with us Wednesday morning. And I would also highly recommend getting the message the Lord gave me for Wednesday night on holding back. But this morning, Zephaniah chapter number 3, we begin our reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city, she obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves, they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the grand privilege of once again assembling with your people in the house of God. Lord, we thank you for this week that we will celebrate Thanksgiving. And Lord, we ought to be more thankful to God than ever before because of all the choice blessings, before, because of all the daily benefits, and because of all the goodness of God. Now, Lord, as we come this morning, I have a weight upon me. Lord, I understand the significance of the message you burdened me with. And, Father, I know that without your help, I cannot do what needs to be done this morning. Lord, I pray that you would constrain my personality and that God you would put a watch guard about my lips and about my mind, help me to say everything that you would have me to say and nothing contrary to the will of God. For Lord, I know the delicacy of the message. And Lord, if not uh, checked and gone unconstrained, oh Lord, this message could do harm. But Lord, in the Spirit of God, it could do great good. So, Father, I pray for unction and power, and I pray for the Spirit of God, Lord, to do a work in this place that only He can do. Lord, there are certain elements that you ask man to do, but then there's the true element that only God can do. And so, Father, we're imploring and pleading and seeking you to do that, which only is possible for God to do. Now, Father, be with those that are sick, be with every prayer request, but for right now, Father, we pray you'd put a hedge about us. We pray for sobriety and seriousness, and we pray for a move and touch of God. Help your people remove the hindrances for their worship, and God do great things, and we'll praise you and exalt you and bless your holy name for it, for it's in the wonderful and glorious and precious name of the Lord Jesus, we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to the text before we get to the thought. I want you to notice that this text deals with Israel. In Zephaniah, we find that the Lord is 
going to literally come back to this earth one day and that when he comes, uh, he is going to judge the nations. You find that in Matthew 25 and you find it in Zephaniah chapter uh, 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 2 especially, but also in chapter 3. And God is going to judge the nations uh, based on part on what they've done with Israel and based on what they've done with him uh, and his word. Uh, but chapter 3 begins, uh, and he's dealing with Israel, uh, and what Israel deal with him uh, and his word. We know in John, he says in John chapter number 1, that he came unto his own, uh, and his own received him not. That was Israel. Uh, he came unto the uh, uh, choice house of the chosen of God. Uh, he came to God's uh, chosen people. When the Syrophoenician woman come and desired uh, her daughter to be healed, he said, I'm not come, but for the all sheep of Israel. Uh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, but as many as received him, hallelujah, brother Phil, this is where we get in, uh, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Uh, but here he's dealing with Israel and how they've dealt with him. Notice, if you will, uh, uh, she's repulsive. Uh, look in verse number one. He says, whoa, that's a strong warning. Whoa, uh, to her that is filthy and polluted, uh, to the oppressing city, uh, Israel, uh, who was God's chosen people, uh, Israel, uh, who was granted the law and precepts of God, uh, Israel, uh, whom Jesus himself uh, came to uh, to be their Messiah, their Christ, their deliverer. Uh, she's become oppressive. She's become filthy. Uh, she's become polluted. Uh, and she's repulsive in the sight of God. Uh, can I say today, the Bible says where much is given, much is required. And God has given America much, and He has blessed America with much, uh, and much is required from America. But can I say, God has given His people much, and much is required uh, from God's people. She's repulsive in the sight of God. Notice her rejection. Look in verse number 2. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. Uh, she trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Uh, she rejected God. You know what scares me, Brother Clint? Is week in and week out, we come to the house of God, God delivers a message, and yet God's people do not draw near to God. It is a dangerous thing to refuse and reject God. Amen. Friend, we can have no peace without Him. We can have no joy without Him. We can have no protection without Him. And it is a dangerous thing to walk in this world outside the hedge of God's protection. We see her rejection. Notice, if you will, the religious in verse number 4. It says, Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. You ought to underscore that verse. Can I say that verse describes a lot of what's going on in churches today? There are a lot of priests and preachers and prophets and uh, 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 as the Bible refers to them, uh, pastors, men of God that stand and they've done harm to the word of God. They've done harm to God's people. they polluted God's people, putting them in bondage, uh, 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 trying to make puppets out of them, trying to do all kinds of things to God's sheep that God did not tell us to do. They lord over God's sheep. They try to control God's sheep. Mm, they slaughter God's sheep. And they have polluted the sanctuary. Can I say much of what is going on in our churches today falls on the shoulders of those that are doing the preaching because they do not deliver God's people. They keep them in bondage. And can I say it's a treacherous thing. Treacherous thing. My whole desire here this morning is to help you. And oh, if you'll pay attention to the message this morning, I believe you'll get some help. I want you to notice the rebellious in verse number 7. Verse number 7 he says, I said, surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. How, howsoever I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. No matter what God did to them, no matter what God put them through, they did not draw to God. They did not turn to God. They did not receive instruction. They did not receive correction. They corrupted all their doings. They were rebellious. Can I say a lot falls on the preachers of our day? Um, but a lot also falls on those who reject and refuse to do what God says. Amen. 
and a lot of folks are rebellious in nature. What I want to focus on is found in verse number 3. Looking at, at how God speaks here, he says, Her princes, Jerusalem's princes, her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves, they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. He said that he had corrected them, and if you look at verse 5 and 6, you'll see where he corrects them. You'll see how he brings chastisement on them, how he judges the wicked, and how he judges even his own city, and how they rebelled against it. Uh, you can see that they did not draw nigh to God, but he said, uh, and all of that, it wasn't the removal of his peace. It wasn't the removal of his hedge. It wasn't uh, 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 the correcting that was the problem. What haunted Israel most he said, came from within. He said it was roaring lions and evening wolves. I want to preach this morning on that very thought. Roaring lions and evening wolves. Can I say what hinders God's moving in our day does not come from without. Oh, we can blame politicians. Uh, we can blame the atmosphere. Uh, we can blame other people, other churches, other denominations. Uh, but those things are not what hurts us. Uh, uh, can I say we can blame other Christians? Uh, and it's not who sits across the pew. It's not who sits behind you. It's not who sits in front of you. That is the problem. Uh, what hinders uh, a move of God in our day comes from within. Uh, it is roaring lions and evening wolves, uh, things that all within and things that know and tear away and erode from within and folks are suffering in our pews from within and do not know what they're going through and how to handle it. Uh, can I say you've heard me say for years where the devil attacks people's in the mind. Amen. And can I say in people's minds sitting here today there are roaring lions and evening wolves that are striving to destroy your spirituality. Can I say, you wake up in the morning with a roaring lion. Amen. You go through your day and something roars at you and, and, and it gnaws at you. And then at night you think, I can finally get some rest. And when you lay down in your bed, there's an evening wolf just constantly tormenting you and putting you in anguish and agony. And you can get no deliverance and no peace. Can I say, what is affecting a lot of folks in our churches the roaring lion and evening wolves that cause this anguish and torment is a term people don't like to talk about. It's a term that preachers say doesn't exist. And it's a term that if preachers do say it exists, it makes you feel inferior as a human being. The roaring lion and evening wolves could be termed depression. Depression. Can I say what is happening in our churches and in our society is an attack called depression. Amen. And depression is hindering God's people from seeing revival and seeing a move of God and seeing God work in tremendous ways in our days and our age. Uh, uh, we are so bogged down with so much and so much stress and so much on us uh, that we live and walk and abide in a state of depression and don't even know it. Uh, when there were great moves uh, in days gone by, they didn't have the stress, they didn't have the pressures uh, that we have today. There used to be a day when women didn't have to work. I understand women have to work and put stress on the home. Uh, there used to be a day uh, when a man could go and get an honest day's wage for uh, labor but today uh, it's even hard for men to get a job uh, we live in a day of depression and a state of depression where folks themselves don't even know what the roaring lion and the evening wolf is doing to them and it affects even Christianity now listen to me there are many things that bring about depression uh, stress is the biggest key that brings depression a sense of loss brings depression, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a loss of your health, a loss of your strength. There's all kinds of factors in it, but today I'm going to give you some statistics and factors and some things about depression, and we'll get to the message on how God's people can overcome and deal with this very topic that most people don't even want to talk about. Let me begin with some statistics on depression. 15% of the population suffers from severe depression. They say every year 20% 20, 20 more people get depressed. 
worldwide. It's in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that are depressed. And 35 to 40 percent of all people depressed are in America. I'm talking about the land of liberty, the land of freedom. I'm talking about the land of abundance. I'm talking about a place where everybody else in the world aspires to come to. Most people suffer depression. They say that 80% of all people will have to deal with depression at one point or another in their life, either personally or somebody around them. 15% of Americans have severe depression. Can I say, 54% believe that depression is personal weakness. That's why folks don't want to talk about it, because if you admit you're depressed, it shows that you're inferior or you're not able to handle it. Can I say that women are twice as likely to be diagnosed with depression than men, and 40% are too embarrassed to seek help. 20% of people with major, major depressive disorder develop psychotic symptoms. 15% of depressed people commit suicide. What's stunning is depression in children is increasing nearly 25% a year. 4% of preschoolers are clinically depressed. Preschoolers. 10% of adolescents have some sort of depression, yet only 30% are receiving treatment. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in ages of 15 to 24, and it's the sixth uh, 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 in ages 5 to 14. Depression is a real thing, it's a real problem, and it's real prevalent in society and even in our churches. Now, there are different types of depression. Now listen, sadness and grief are normal human emotions. We all have those feelings and usually we get over them in a few days. Now listen, major depression is a period of overwhelming sadness and involves a loss of interest in things that once brought enjoyment. If you're not over something in, in a week or two, there's a good chance you have major depression. Persistent depressive disorder is when depression lasts two years or more. Bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness is a less common type of depression, and they involve cycles of lows and extreme highs. There are folks that... Uh, have manic depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. They won't sleep for days. Uh, they'll rearrange their furniture like crazy. They'll repaint their house. Uh, they'll decide one moment they're going somewhere and they'll drive 1,400 miles and stay up for weeks and then all of a sudden hit a low and won't come out of the room. There is something called seasonal affective disorder. It's a depression that's triggered by sunlight. Mm, folks are more likely to be depressed in the winter time because the sun doesn't shine as long. There's postpartum depression. This occurs in new mothers. Now, most new mothers uh, face the baby blues, they call them. When you first have a baby, your whole schedule gets changed and you're going through uh, the hormonal changes and then you don't sleep as much because the baby's eating every three hours and doesn't sleep through the night and you have baby blues. But then there's something those baby blues go on. If it goes on for several weeks, uh, 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 it turns into uh, postpartum depression. And then there's withdrawal from the mother where she doesn't even want to care for the child. And then there's psychotic depression. It's when major depression or bipolar disorder are accompanied by hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. About 20% of people with major depression develop psychotic symptoms. Now, let me give you the symptoms of depression. There are emotional symptoms. Extreme irritability over minor things. Could be an emotional sign you're depressed. Anxiety and restlessness are signs of emotional depression. Anger management issues are a symptom. Loss of interest in favorite activities, that's a big one, everything I've read. Folks who used to be very active, who enjoyed certain things, all of a sudden lose all interest in those things they used to enjoy. That's a symptom you're depressed. There are some people that used to be faithful to the house of God, but 
now they just don't want to have anything to do with it. Now preachers will say, well, they're backsliding out of the will of God. It might be they're just depressed. Amen. A fixation on the past or a fixation on things that have gone wrong in your life is a symptom of emotional depression. As a pastor, you don't know how many times I've had to deal with people that have a hard time letting go of their past. Have a hard time of letting go of their failures. That is a symptom of emotional depression. And then thoughts of death or suicide. That's a symptom of depression. Those are emotional symptoms. There are physical symptoms of depression. Insomnia or sleeping too much is a symptom, a physical symptom. Debilitating fatigue is a physical symptom. Uh, weight gain or weight loss is a physical symptom symptom. Difficulty concentrating or making decisions is a physical symptom. And unexplained aches and pains are physical symptoms. I don't know how many times over the years I've known people that went to the doctor and had every test run to man. The doctors say nothing's wrong, but they're always hurting. They're always in pain. But the doctors can't find anything. Could be a physical symptom that you're depressed. Now listen. In children, you may find a symptom of depression when they are very clingy. They don't want to ever leave your side. They used to be very independent, but now all of a sudden they're just real clingy. Or if they refuse to go to school, they just don't want to go to school. There's no reason that they should not want to go to school, but all of a sudden they don't want to, they might be they're depressed. In teens, you find that with them being excessively negative about everything. Or if you see that uh, uh, they begin avoiding friends or activities they used to really enjoy. Could be they're depressed. Now, let me give you some causes for depression, some risk factors. Can I say there's no single cause of depression? There's not one little thing you can put your finger on and say, yep, yep, that's it. It's a culmination of a lot of things. Could be brain chemistry. Uh, we have uh, a fluid in our our brainstem called serotonin, and if those levels are high or low in either way, that can cause different characteristics and traits. One of them being depression, but not only brain chemistry it could be hormonal. It could be genetic. If you had a close relative who had bouts of depression and all of a sudden you're starting to have symptoms, it could be genetic. Now, there are other factors that can lead to depression. And one is a low self-esteem. Low self-esteem can lead you to depression. An anxiety disorder can lead to depression. A borderline personality disorder could lead to depression. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of our military comes back and Amen. suffer that after Amen. facing tremendous and extreme things. Uh, physical or sexual abuse can lead to depression. Chronic disease. You're diagnosed with a disease that you'll never be cured from can lead to depression. Alcohol or drug abuse leads to depression. Uh, there are certain prescription drugs that can cause you to be depressed. And again, family history plays a part. Now, how can we be diagnosed with depression? Well, the best thing you can do if you have any of these symptoms is go talk to your doctor. The doctor can do certain blood tests and do certain things, but there is no test to, to, to date to determine it where your ser serotonin levels are but there are some mm, tests that certain doctors can do in your psyche that will determine whether or not those levels are where they should be now listen there's a difference between having a major depress depressive state or situation and being clinically depressed if you are di diagnosed with clinical depression, if you are diagnosed with bipolar disorder or manic 
disorders or you are clinically depressed and the doctor puts you on medication to help adjust those serotonin levels and help you uh, to where you can function and get through your depression. This is very elementary, very key. Stay on your medicine. Uh, listen, I have uh, high blood pressure. Usually when I'm doing the Baptist, but I do have high blood pressure. They discovered this last year, and they put me on blood pressure medicine. Guess what? When I take my blood pressure medicine, I have no blood pressure problems. If I stop taking my blood pressure medicine, I'll have a problem, which could go to serious problems lead to stroke or heart attack or who knows what. Also, several years ago, and as a matter of fact, I can prove this one to you, go and get a CD from three or four years ago and listen, and you'll notice that I sniff all the time while I'm preaching. It wasn't a sinus thing. I just sniffed. It was driving me crazy. All the time just sniffing. I'm thinking... I'm not a dog. I shouldn't sniff. So I went and saw my doctor. He said, I've got the same thing. And he named some rhino something thing about this long. And he gave me a prescription dose spray. He said, here, take this. You'll quit sniffing. I haven't sniffed in the last two years or three years. How long have I been on that nose spray? It cured my sniff. But if I quit the nose spray, I'll go back to sniffing. Now I said all that to say this. There are certain medicines that help you. It has been my experience, and I've had experience with folks that have bipolar disease or people that have manic uh, uh, problems or manic depression. They're constantly depressed. And they'll go see a doctor. And these men that have spent uh, their lifetime studying these things and lifetime giving to these things, uh, and they'll help them. They'll give them medication, and the medication starts working and helping. And all of a sudden, it seems like, uh, especially these folks that are bipolar, manic, uh, they think, okay, now I'm cured, and they quit taking the medicine and they end up right back where they start from and they can't understand why take your meds I want to have a stroke all I got to do is quit taking my blood pressure medicine I'll have a stroke someday and then I can blame everybody in the world I can blame God I can blame the doctors I can blame everybody but it's my fault because I didn't do right well, who do you think gave doctors wisdom God now listen to me especially in Christianity. There are people that suffer manic or bipolar situations and they think God's going to heal them of it and if they get on meds, they start feeling better and think God's healed them, they quit the meds and then all of a sudden they want to blame God. With my sniffing and my blood pressure, that does not make me a lesser individual because I have that chronic problem. Thank the Lord that there was somebody in my life that told me how to help alleviate the symptoms and give me a better quality life. If you're diagnosed with clinical depression, it does not make you a lesser individual. It does not make you a weak-minded individual. It doesn't make you a, 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 some kind of a, a off-scour of the world and everybody is to fear you. It just means that you need a little help to have a better life. Amen. But most depression isn't clinical. Most depression can be dealt with and handled in other manners. Listen, there are complications dealing with depression if it's untreated if it's prolonged or chronic depression all those things can lead to alcohol and drug abuse it can lead to headaches and other chronic aches and pains it can lead to phobias and panic disorders and anxiety attacks it can lead to uh, overweight or obesity due to eating disorders which raise the risk of heart disease and type 2 diabetes it can lead to self mutilation and it can lead you to have suicidal tendencies now I just said that most depression is not clinical depression 
And I've said it's affecting churches and it's affecting uh, Christianity. Let me give you spiritual symptoms of depression for saved people. Now listen to me, I'm no fool. I don't believe everybody comes to church is saved and ready to go to heaven. Some of you have roaring lions and evening wolves because you're lost and the devil wants to keep you lost. But saved people are not exempt from depression. And let me give you some of the symptoms, spiritual symptoms, if you are depressed and you are a saved individual. First of all, is isolation. You don't want to be around anybody. I got news for you. God made us as human beings a desire to be around other people. Now there are days, trust me, I'd like to be on an island. But that should, days shouldn't be weeks and months and years. Amen. Isolationism is not what God intended for us to be. He intended for us to assemble together as saints. He intended for us to worship together. He intended for us to have fellowship together. And he intended for us to be and make a difference in the lives of others. Isolationism might be a symptom of a saved person being depressed. Not only that, inactivity. Folks that used to be active in church and used to be faithful in the things of God and used to do things and now all of a sudden you can't get them to do anything, they might just be depressed. And it may also come to insecurity. You know who ought to be the most secure people in the world? Saved people. Because we're secure in Jesus. But when you have a saved person who becomes very insecure in all facets of their life, it just might be they're depressed. Now, listen, spiritual depression in a saved person affects worship. If you are depressed, you cannot worship God as if you're not depressed. Matter of fact, you want to be isolated, you want to be inactive, you're insecure, you can't worship. Because those that worship the Lord must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And when you're depressed, your spirit is not where it should be and you are not trusting in the truths of God's precious word. That's why you're depressed. It not only affects worship, it affects your witness. It sure is difficult to be a light to somebody else when you're acting like Eeyore. Everybody knows Eeyore is the depressed donkey. It also affects the work of revival. I want to deal with saved folks depressed. Now listen to me. Spiritual depression begins with failing to submit to God's word or God's will, leaving one sifted with roaring lions and evening wolves. The lack of peace and unanswered prayer has everything to do with fellowship and not relationship. These folks had to deal with roaring lions and evening wolves. Go back and read verse 3, within. Why? Because in verse 2, they did not draw nigh to God. They did not trust in God's word. They did not do what God said to do. Verse 7, even though he corrected them, they still corrupted the things of God. And my dear friends, when you sit in the house of God and God delivers the message uh, and you refuse to do what God says, uh, you reject the will of God, you reject the word of God, uh, uh, friend, uh, uh, you are inviting roaring lions and evening wolves into your life uh, and you will not have peace, you will not have joy, you will not be satisfied in the things of God uh, because you've rejected them rather than embrace them. So many churches... People lose their peace. They lose their inactivity. They're isolated. They sit there and a preacher beats them up, beats them up, beats them up, tells them they need to get born again. They'll run to an altar. They'll go through the motions. And nothing changes because now they've grieved God even more. Because if you're born again, the Holy Ghost lives within inside of you. And when you quench him and grieve him, you have no peace. And when you refuse and reject the things of God, you will not have peace within. You'll have that roaring lion. You'll have that evening wolf. Can I say you can live as close to God as you want to and you can still face that roaring lion in your mind. But oh, so much more when you refuse the things of God. Now listen, 
when you reject and refuse the things of God and that peace is removed and then you, you think it's, a, it's an encounter that you're not saved and you come and you go through the motion again you're grieving God even you're telling him what he's done in your life isn't real and you grieve him even more and you face more roaring lions and evening wolves so how can we overcome our roaring lions and even evening wolves first of all you do it through dependence just like an addict feels like they have to depend on what they're addicted to it's time we get dependent upon God what caused the symptoms in the first place was rejecting God we need to get dependent on the things of the Lord Romans 12 1 says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice uh, wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service uh, we need to submit ourselves to become dependent upon the Lord uh, if he can't help us we're in a mess uh, yeah I'm glad he gave doctors some wisdom yeah I'm glad he gave some men of God wisdom uh, but there's no wisdom like the wisdom God gives uh, and when we can become dependent upon him uh, we'll find help in time of need uh, the Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 7 submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he'll flee from you draw nigh to God he'll draw nigh to you cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts you double minded when you have roaring lions and evening wolves are messing with your mind, you can't let God have your mind. You're dealing with all that turmoil. You're double-minded. Uh, the Bible says resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God and God will draw nigh to you. The problem is we don't resist that roaring lion. We listen to him. We get further and further down and out and depressed. Sometimes we're our worst enemy. You know, the mind is a beautiful thing. It's a complicated thing. And you know the old adage, mind over matter? You know that your mind has the ability to heal many of your elements? You know? As a man thinketh, so is he, the Bible says. Amen. If you think that you're sick, guess what you're going to be? Sick. Amen. Now listen, if you have cancer, you can't think cancer away. But you can have the mentality that you're going to beat it. And guess what? The odds are you will in this day and age. But if you think, well, this thing's got me. I'm done. Guess what? Go pick out a tombstone. You're done. The mind is a very powerful thing. And when you give your mind to the roaring lions and evening wolves, they'll run with it. And you'll run down that road and you'll end up so depressed you won't know which way is up. What, how do you combat that preacher? You depend on the Lord. Amen. Submit to the Lord. Give the Lord your mind. Think on the things of the Lord. It comes with dependence, but it also comes with de deafening. You've got to deafen them, that roar out of your mind. There's a reason he calls the devil a roaring lion. The lion's the king of the jungle. He's not the toughest, toughest cat in the, in, the, in the jungle, but he's the king of the jungle. Why? Because there's roar. He roars, everybody else runs. Well, he gets the roaring in your mind. Amen. It's hard to hear the still small voice of the Lord. So you've got to deafen him. How do you deafen the lion? Well, the Bible says in Romans 12 too. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you renew your mind? Well, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. It says, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Amen. Perfect peace have they whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. How do you transform your mind? How do you deafen the roaring line? You've got to think on things that are true. The Word of God. You've got to think on things that are pure and lovely and of good report. Anything of virtue, anything of praise. Those things that God has given us, you've got to dwell on those things, not the roaring line. If you're saved, 
God has made you a king and a priest. He's made you a priest to where you don't need to go through some middleman to get to God. We have one mediator between God and man, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can go directly to the Lord. He's made you a priest. But he's also made you a king to rule and reign over this flesh. And included in that is your mind. And you have the ability to think what you want to think. But you've got to choose how to think. Now you can run down that negative road. You can listen to that roaring line tell you how sorry no good you are and how you blew it and how you did this and how you did that. And you can listen to him and he'll have his way with you. Or you can start pleading the blood of Jesus over those things and get it right with God and then start thinking on the good things of God. Amen. Think about how good he's been to you. Think about his blessings. Amen. Think about what he's gone to prepare for you. Think about all the, uh, uh, the times that uh, when you was down, he'd come by and lifted you up. Huh? Choose to think properly and you'll deafen the roar of the lion. Again, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Amen. Too many of us don't resist. We entertain. And then we get in trouble. You've got to depend upon the Lord through dependence. You overcome depression. You overcome the roaring lion and the evening wolves. Through deafening, you overcome. Through delighting. The Bible has a lot to deal with. Our delights. I like Phil Robertson. Three people know who he is. Huh? Duck Dynasty. He's the patriarch. He's, he's known for three words. Same word. He says, happy, happy, happy. He knows no matter what happens, he's going to kill something in the woods. And he's going to come home and Miss Kay's going to cook it. And he's happy. But more important than that, if you really watch that show, you'll find it many times when other people are going on. If you see in the background, Phil's over there reading his Bible. He's found how to delight himself. The Bible tells us how to be delighting. Yes. Psalms 1 says this in verse number 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. When was the last time you delighted in the Word of God and then meditated on it day and night? You know what will run the wolves away and run the lion away? The Word. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know how the Lord defeated Satan in the wilderness when the devil came to tempt him? Three times, he says, it is written. You know what will send the devil running quicker than anything? The Word. And you delight in the Word, you meditate on the Word, and oh, my dear friends, your countenance will change, Amen. your depression will change, because joy will start coming back, and the joy of the Lord your strength. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord. Not only in His Word, in Him. Amen. When was the last time you just had a good talk with Him? You said, Lord, you're so good to me. You made the sun shine today. Oh Lord, I was in Canton yesterday and there's snow blowing and it's cold and here, you know, it was a beautiful morning. You just delight in the Lord. Just talk to Him. Right. He Amen. said, Delight thyself also in the Lord. And He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. <clears throat> if you're depressed, deep down in your heart, you don't want to be depressed. <clears throat> Folks that are depressed have a hard time getting out of bed some days, but deep down inside they want to get out of bed. Well, if you learn to delight yourself in the law of the Lord and delight yourself in the Lord himself, guess what? He'll give you the desires of your heart. You'll get out of bed. You'll enjoy life. All of a sudden, that depression starts losing its stronghold on you. It's through delighting. And I like what Paul said in Acts chapter number 2. When he's standing before King Agrippa. Now, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's a man of God who's been in prison, he's been shipwrecked, he's been beaten three times, he's been stoned, and here he is, he's brought before King Agrippa, he's in chains, uh, and his life is in Agrippa's hands. Uh, here's a man that if there's anybody that should be depressed, it ought to be Paul. 
And Agrippa looks at him and says, what are you doing here? He says, this very thing, Acts chapter 2, 26, verse 2. He said, he said, I think myself happy. He said, I'm happy to be here for you, Agrippa, because now I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Huh? When you've thought about the Lord all day and you've thought about the goodness of God all day, you can't help but be happy and you can't help but want to tell somebody else about him. Huh? Where do you think Phil got happy, happy, happy? He got it from the Apostle Paul, man. Here's a guy uh, 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 whose life is in uh, the balance of a judge uh, and he says, I'm happy because uh, I can tell you about Jesus and how he changed my life. Praise the Lord. You can overcome your roaring lion and evening wolves by delighting in the things of God, by depending on God, by deafening those things through the things of God and through how you think. Can I say this? You can overcome him through determining. Philippians 4.11 says this, the Apostle Paul suffered many things, more things than anybody in this building has ever suffered. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You need to be determined that no matter what goes on in this world, whatever God has blessed you with and whatever God's placed you, just to be content to be where God's at. Amen. A lot of folks' depression happens when they start looking at other people. <laughs> looking at what their address is, looking at what they drive, look at where they work, look at this, look at that. Can I say the grass always looks greener on the other side? And I already said where much is given, much is required. And you know what comes with big house? Big, big tax payments. Big electric bills. You know what happens with big gas guzzling car? Stopping at the gas station more. Huh? Yeah, it all looks good when it's shiny. But walk a mile in their shoes. You might be glad to get back to where you are. Just be content with where God has placed you and blessed you. Listen, he knows all about us and he does all things well. He knows what we can handle, what we can't handle. Quit murmuring, complaining, quit worrying, quit whining. Just be content that God even knows where you are, that God even cares about you. Just be glad to be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Just determine that no matter what goes on, you're going to do everything you can to keep your relationship right with the Lord and be content with what He's blessed you with and where He's placed you. Amen, That'd be all right. Yeah. Can I help you something? You say, Preacher, you don't know what I've lost. You don't know what I've suffered. You don't. It didn't catch God by surprise. Long before you ever knew it, He knew it. And He allowed it to happen because He knew you could handle it. What you need to know is that you can handle it. Huh? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. Amen. You can handle it or God wouldn't allow you to face it. Let me say this. How to overcome your roaring lion and evening wool. Just simply dive into the arms of the Lord. Whenever them, them, them roar, the roar starts getting loud, whenever them wolves start gnawing, just dive into the arms of the Lord. There are so many verses in the Bible where the Lord bears up his children, where the Lord holds his children, where the Lord's mighty arm reaches down and plucks up his children. Just dive into his arms, friend. There's no greater place to be than in the arms of the Lord, in the shadow of his wings. Uh, 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 he even told Jerusalem, how many times would I not take you in like a, a, a hen uh, broods over her chicks? How many times he would not protect us from all these things if we would just run to him? Yeah. Just run to him. Amen. Uh, I love telling this this story is true. Several years ago, I went to the library. Anybody remember what those are? Yeah. You know, I know we got Wikipedia now. Nobody even needs a library. Spent $18 million on that library in 18, and all it is is an empty building. huh? Used to, you had to go to the library to check out books because you couldn't get them online. You know, used to, we read. You know, we didn't get, you know, news briefs and sound bites. But, the Lord was dealing, I was, I was reading the Bible, and the Lord was dealing with me, and I went and I checked out a bunch of books on flowers. Now, I would not suggest you doing that if you're not comfortable in your masculinity, okay? 
I did. They looked at me crazy. I had all these books on flowers. I think they might even ask me, first work down in county, you into horticulture? Nope. I was just reading the Bible. I want to learn about these flowers. Uh, the Bible deals with a lot about nature. And so I was reading the Bible, and I was reading, and I was, I was over there in Song of Solomon, and I read where he's the lily of the valley. So I, I was really looking at that, and I was really studying on those lilies. And I, wanted to know, I preached a message on the lily. I don't know if you remember. I preached a message on the lily. There's a lot of attributes about the lily. It's a wonderful message, and I was so glad to learn all that stuff. But one of the things, Brother Gary, that I read and found out about those lilies, you know, they, they grow wherever vegetation is, wherever man is. You can find a lily. If you can find a man, you can find a lily. And one of the things, Brother Terry, a lily doesn't give off its fragrance till it's broken. And over in England, Scotland, Ireland, what you call the old country where Thad's people are from, that's why Thad's kind of weird. <laughs> Truthfully, most of us came from that country, so we're all kind of... But over there, they used to hunt. They'd send out the hounds. And the hounds would trip up the fox or trip up the deer, and they'd come on horseback. You've seen them on, on the old cartoons. and guy would have the trumpet, blow the trumpet, and they'd all go to where the trumpet is, and they're on the horse, and, you know, they'd all get the, the fox or get the deer or whatever. But they told me deer, it was instinctive in them, that when those hounds got on their trail, and you're an old hunter, those deer knew if they could get to a lily patch. Running through that lily patch, the hounds would lose the scent of the deer because of the scent of the lily. And if you can ever learn when those roaring lions and those evening wolves are on your trail, if you can just get to the lily, yeah. huh? Yeah. the hounds will lose all sight of you because they got to deal with the lily. Yeah, God help us uh, when we get low, when we get to where we can't feel like we can't handle it, when it gets too big for us, uh, not to isolate ourselves, uh, uh, not to draw away and become inactive, not to get insecure, uh, uh, become the most secure we ever can by diving into the arms of the lily and giving it to him. Uh, and he'll help you Amen. with your depression. Now look. I said earlier, if you are clinically diagnosed with depression and a doctor puts you on medication for it, stay on your meds. Most depression in saved people is not clinical. Most depression in saved people is because we have not taken seriously what God's already put out before us in his word. We get to looking around this world, we got to dealing with this world, and we got the stress of this world draw us away from that book and away from the Lord. And the roaring lions and evening wolves begin to haunt us. And we get depressed. And Brother Josh, here's what's happened. See, I know this. My wife's in the medical field. I know this. Over 80% of the time, if you go to the doctor and you request a medicine that you've seen on TV, they're going to write a script for your darling wife to fill it out, and they're going to give it to her. You get to watching them shows on TV where them people are holding up them, them little smiley faces, but inside they're messed up and they're, they're depressed. And again, it's a real thing. But a lot of saved people, Instead of diving into the arms of the lily, instead of doing the things that we've talked about, deafening and depending and determining yourself uh, uh, that you're going to overcome these things by the help and hand of the Lord, instead of doing that, you'll run to the doctor. Instead of going to the great physician, you'll run to the doctor and you'll cry a sob story about how low you are and how, how terrible things are in your life. And the doctor will give you something you saw on TV, mm -hmm. and you'll start taking it, and all of a sudden you zone out. You don't feel anything. You don't hear any roaring lions. You don't hear any evening wolves gnawing at you. You're just out there in la la land. Because you're not clinically depressed, but you're taking something that's altering your mind, and it's making you think you feel better. And then you come to church, and the man of God gets up and preach, and you don't hear half of what he says because you're out there in la la land. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't have revival. We got people sitting in our churches that have chemically altered themselves for something they didn't really need. What they needed was Jesus. Amen. And it's hindering Amen. our churches. It's hindering our worship. 
Now again, if you are clinically depressed, take your medicine. But most people aren't clinically depressed. Have they faced a major depression uh, uh, disorder in their life? Yes. And it's because the roaring lion and evening wolves are allowed to haunt them within because they have rejected and refused to draw nigh to God. If we truly give our hearts to God, it would straighten out our heart problem and our mind problem. And we would see a greater move of God in our churches. So many of us are depending on things that really don't help us. The one who can help us, his name is Jesus. Amen. And this morning, he'll help you. Say, preacher, I'm not on any medicine. Yeah, but is that roaring lion? Is that evening wolf just tormenting you and causing you anguish, causing you not to sleep at night, causing you not to function during the day, causing you uh, all kinds of problems? I got news for you. You don't have to carry him around your back. Amen. There is help at the feet of Jesus. Yes, sir. And can I say, it's not a quick fix. Every day you got to determine you're going to delight in the Lord. Every day you got to discipline yourself that I'm going to de deafen that voice by getting something from God. I'm going to think on things that God uh, has designed for me to think on that is going to bring help and bring blessing uh, and that is going to defeat this sorry no good thing that has got its hold on me. You can't overcome it. But just like anything else, you just can't remove it. It's got to be replaced with something. And what it needs to be replaced with is Jesus.